us now is Salah Abul Ghassam with Islamic Relief, who's in Gaziantep. Salah, one thing that is very stark is when you see, you know, all of this aid, all of these rescue crews around individual scenes in Turkey, but right across the border in Syria. Uh, one expert told us today that only about 5% of buildings there have been able to be searched for signs of life because they just don't have the resources. Um, has your organization be, been able to get anything into Syria? Yes. Um, I mean, we, we've been working around the clock. We've been doing an absolute, our absolute best in order to get supplies into Syria. We were fortunate in the sense that our staff, we already have a base. We've been working in Syria since the offset of, of the war 12 years ago. So that has given us a, a sort of unique placement where we already had items within our warehouse. We already had a local operation. We already have a series of doctors. You know, we, we need to put the context and we need to understand the context. Northwest Syria is unfortunately uh, an area that doesn't have any coordinated effort, doesn't have a clear uh, governance. So what that means subsequently is that the Ministry of Health that may exist in Turkey doesn't exist in that part of Syria. Right. The Ministry of Education doesn't exist. So therefore, it, it, it unfortunately falls upon organizations like ourselves on a monthly basis prior to this earthquake to supplement the salaries and pay the salaries of doctors, of teachers, um, to consistently provide aid and assistance. 1.3 million people in, in, in that region in Syria were already living in tents and have been for the last eight years. Yeah. That's the scale. There was already a humanitarian crisis. Um, what we're seeing firsthand on the ground, just to put things into perspective, you know, you're showing scenes there uh, in, in Syria. What we know from our staff on the ground is that search and rescue efforts, everyone is doing the best that they can with the resources that they can. But what we're seeing is that because of the, the absence of any coordination, Yesterday, one of my colleagues was talking about the fact that they were so jubilant that they'd rescued uh, a young girl. That girl was taken similar to what you're seeing now into an ambulance. But that ambulance then was stuck for more than three hours trying to, because as you can imagine in a disaster sort of scene, people are coming in providing. People are also trying to go out with ambulances in order to get to the hospitals yeah. or whatever it may be. Yeah. She ended up passing away because the hospital couldn't reach where it needed to. So, Ultimately, we're doing what we can. We're going above and beyond. We're really calling upon the international community to understand and to wake up and realize that the crisis in Syria has been ongoing. It's only become worse now. There is a multiple humanitarian crises. There was one that existed before. There's one that's gone to a new level now. And the new one that's coming that we need to be very aware of is if we don't react enough, if we don't provide enough shelter, if we don't provide enough food, we do not provide enough assistance. We do not ensure that that humanitarian corridor exists. More lives are going to be lost. And our real message that we're giving to people is history will talk about. You know, the reporters prior to me speaking and hearing very well, yes, this historically is the worst earthquake in a century. Who knows what the numbers will be? Nobody can give you that accurate number because no one is yet to actually know what that number will be. Mm -hmm. But when the numbers those numbers are not numbers, they're individual people. And those individual people's lives that are being lost the worst thing we, that could possibly happen, we can't do anything about what's happened, but what we can do is assist those who are survivors. And the forms of assistance that we can do, you know, is, is supporting organizations like ourselves to provide the continued medical assistance, to provide the shelter, but also ultimately we need to get the global community, the international community to understand that enough is enough. Enough is enough. The people of suffer Syria have been suffering long enough. It's been 12 years of pain, 12 years of suffering. This crisis, you know, it's happened. And ultimately now, it's our responsibility, each and every single one of us, to make sure that the history that's written shows that there was a global effort to make a difference. Yeah. There was a global effort in order to make sure that those who needed the assistance and the support in the time of an unprecedented crisis receive and that's why we're really advocating and pushing for a clear humanitarian corridor you're hearing a lot about aid not being received we're doing our best we're working around the clock and it's it's a global effort to ensure that the people are not forgotten you know some of the sort of stuff that you're hearing from the syrians on the ground just just that look at that look at that building you know they're saying some of these buildings 
What more can you do to them? Right, right. People were already living in, in substandard shelters that were already had so much shrapnel, had so much damage from the multiple bombardments. They were already structurally non-sound. There is an absence of any building regulation because as you can imagine, internally displaced people come, they want to you know, have a base, they, they, they form any form of structure that they can. So the damage that they will have yes. because of the shelters were not built properly, because of the fact that they were already had multiple shelling is extensive. And an earthquake, you can imagine in Turkey, we're seeing, despite the fact that, yes, that there have been challenges with some of the buildings, but many of them, at least there's been some form of process. Whereas in, in, in Syria, it's a whole different matter. So we need to understand what we're dealing with. We need to understand the generational impact on young people. And our message is really, really simple. Please, global international community, assist organizations, yep. provide aid. Let us save the people of Syria. Let us support. You know, it's really a race against time to support those in Turkey, those in Syria. Aid is reaching. We need to increase the aid. We need to increase the support. We need to ensure that we focus on the humanitarian crisis and, and support where support is required. Yeah, and tell us about what you and your crew have been able to do there in Gaziantep. Um, among your team, are you working the rescues? Are you distributing aid? What have you been able to do there? So in, in, in Turkey specifically, we've been working in multiple areas. We've been working uh, in Gaziantep. Um, we've been working in Kahrama Marash, we've been working in um, Nordic, we've been working in Hatay and all of the uh, towns and cities around it. Uh, we've also been working in Adyaman. In all of these areas, we are um, dictated by need. So some of the things that, 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 that your colleagues were talking about rightfully were there is a coordinated effort in Turkey to understand where are the needs. Okay. Uh, we're working with lots of municipalities to, to understand that. Yesterday, we were going to areas for which, and this is important today, I spent multiple hours with our teams doing needs assessments. There are host communities now in areas that have not been affected that have received people from the affected areas. They're starting to, you know, there's multiple uh, families living in households. So we're trying to, to reach them. Yesterday, we were in rural areas where lots of the towns and villages, the big aid trucks can't receive, so we are taking smaller vehicles and going and assisting them there. We've been providing blankets, food. We're starting to provide shelter. There's lots of efforts going on, both in Turkey and in Syria. We're thankful to all of the people who've, who've, who've donated, who supported our aid effort. Our aid effort is going to continue, but one of the key messages that we want people to appreciate and understand is that no one could have ever prepared for this. The disaster is huge. It's unprecedented. The numbers are there. It's not something that overnight will change, and it's not something overnight mm -hmm. that will come better. We need to understand that we need the, the, the commitment of people for the long term. You know, right now we're starting to have discussions on recovery, uh, reconstruction, and long-term development is is quite far away from now, and, and at times it, it can become overwhelming to think about when you're dealing with disaster. But we don't know how to experience part of the discussions we're having conducting those needs assessments, seeing what the requirements are, and trying to put plans in place for the medium to long term. Right, it, uh, this Thank you so much. I think these things really needed to be said, so we appreciate it.